This is Stranger Things, Rebel Robin by A.R. Capetta. This is part two, chapter 15. November 6th, 1983. Milton and I are watching MTV. Let me rephrase that. I'm reading a dual language edition of Dante's Divine Comedy while Milton plays keyboard over Duran Duran video unfolding on the TV. He doesn't just mimic the song either. Trying to keep up with chord progressions, he's actually adding another layer of music on top of everything he listens to. Sometimes it meshes with the original song. Sometimes it's an odd, quirky counterpoint. Sometimes it feels like he's scribbling over the original, making something better. He's got the volume on the TV turned all the way up, which the rest of the family hates, which is how we keep getting the den all to ourselves. Milton, I shout. Which one do you like better? Duran or Duran? He reaches over and grabs a pillow from the couch and throws it at me with one hand without missing a single literal beat. We've been doing this every day for weeks. I first came to Milton's house after auditions, which got neither of us cast in the play. Surprise! Tam did get a role, not Emily, which she tried to be cheerful about when the cast list went up. But I could tell she was more than a little disappointed. I have apparently st stared at her in history class, enough to know that when she's upset, she tugs in a half-hearted way at the, at the red wisps of her bangs. Anyway, when I first got to Milton's, I was shocked to find the setup as well as a bedroom that Milton had wallpapered with posters and liner notes of his favorite punk and new wave bands. I knew that he was both musical and a nerd, but Milton is an enthusiast, is an, is an enthusiast on a whole other level. He's obsessed with the details of oral history, and oral in this case is spelled A-U-R-A-L, pronounced the same way as O-R-A-L. And he plays about nine instruments besides the trumpet and the keyboard. Oh yeah, this oral is about your ear. One of them I hadn't even heard of before. It's called a theremin, and it's absolutely bizarre. It's electronic, but Milton doesn't even have to touch it. He just moves his hands, and those two metal antennas can sense where they are and release sound accordingly. It looks like a keyboard minus the keys plus a lot of old-timey ma magician waving. Right now, he's playing his pride and joy, Yamaha. The first time Milton asked if we could watch MTV together, I thought it was the beginning of, of the end of our very short friendship. MTV is what everyone in our school watches, but Milton doesn't watch it like everyone else. When we sat together, or sat down, and Milton hovered over his keys, I found myself watching with a drop jaw as he filled out a new, a brand new harmony over the strains of David, David Bowie and Queen's power team up, Under Pressure. Under Pressure. You don't even own a single band t-shirt, I said, incredulous. I wear the clothes my brother wore before he left for college, Milton said, looking down, down at himself like he'd never really thought about it before. They're clean, they fit okay, they're dorky, but I guess I am too. You can't have an entire hand-me-down personality, I insisted. There are parts of, of you that nobody can see. Important parts. Doesn't that bother you? Of course. As soon as I spouted all of that, I realized that I was wearing my mom's old jeans and a t-shirt from a second-hand shop. Milton cocked his head really thinking about it. My brother is the oldest son, which means that he gets new everything, the best of everything, but he has to pay it all back by being perfect, and he doesn't seem to mind living up to the expectation. Personally, I don't mind having less pressure on my life. It's the only real trade-off is wearing old khakis. Milton shook his head without turning away from the keys. Besides, I know that I'm into music. Why do I have to prove it with a shirt? That's 
far too healthy an attitude. Please say something angsty to balance it out. Oh, believe me, I have plenty of angst under all these hand-me-downs, Milton said evenly. Right now, he's got some of that, right now, he's got some of that feeling on display, frowning with the distaste of the visuals of hungry like the wolf, even while his hands pound out an alter alternate melody. I thought you loved Duran Duran, I say. I appreciate them as early users of complex electronic audio layering. Their night ver versions are some of the first ripples of the new wave. But the visuals? So far, the vague concept seems to center on the band running around, pretending to be multiple Indiana Joneses. They're using an Asian country because they think it's exotic. I bet they don't know a single thing about Sri Lanka. And the sexy cat woman thing is, uh, I cringe at the phrase of sexy cat woman. Becomes a much bigger part of the storyline. Yikes. I was wrong before. I admit, healthy and angsty aren't opposites. This is very healthy angst. Yet, they, they, they can't seem to make a single video that doesn't treat people other than white British men like props and scenery, Milton says. Hey, I got angsty enough to use a double negative. I'm so proud of you, and so not proud of this band, I say clicking the channel and then turning the TV off. Milton slides into a new song, which seems to be a symphonic version of Prince's Little Red Corvette. Even though I completely threw off his, his rhythm, Milton doesn't, doesn't seem nervous or upset. I've realized that whenever he's in his element, playing music at home, or even better, playing music at home, his nerves melt away to basically nothing. How do you do it? I ask setting my chin on the arm of the couch, my legs kicked up behind me. We've talked about this, Robin. How do you read poetry in a revolving door of four languages? Three of them are in the same language family, I say with a smirk. Milton throws another pillow, but this time I'm ready with a counterattack, throwing one that knocks his down in midair, with a second pillow lined up to hit him right in the chest. It makes sense in my head. I say, sitting, sitting back, sitting back victoriously. It's like as soon as I can see enough of the words, the second I unlock some kind of understanding, the rest starts to fill itself in. That's how it is with music too, he says. You know, for a band nerd, you don't think in music, you think in words and puzzles and problems to be solved. What do you like? He's goading me, and I know it. Milton has a lot of talent, but he thinks of, of himself as a fan, first and foremost. He loves, not necessarily in this order, sci-fi novels, cult films, comic books, and every form of counterculture music. He has a soft spot for New Wave, because the electronic instruments they use come from Japan. And as he told me the second time we watched MTV together, that makes it half Japanese, like me. I don't happen to share his love of fluffy-haired singers and pulpy paperbacks with solemn-looking aliens on the cover, but I must be a fan of something, according to Milton. There's a lot of dislike out there, though. It's a veritable buffet of bad choices. There's so much that I'm dead set against that sometimes it can't be hard to remember what I'm for. Echo and the Buddymen, Brian Eno, Cindy Lauper. Cindy Lauper is a pop singer, Milton says. And you're a pedant, I shoot back. Have you listened to her album? Or do you just sneer at the singles? Ouch! Milton clutches his chest, then he turns back to his Yamaha. All Through the Night is a great song, he mutters, and immediately takes up the weird electronic bagpipe solo note for note. You do know what I like, I say. How else did we end up dressed as Annie Lennox and Boy George for Halloween? Milton hasn't dressed up since we were in elementary school, so let me pick up the costumes. I found I've, I've always favored music videos that involve some kind of cross-dressing or general gender smashing. I found a suit at the thrift store that actually fit me, and an orange wig at the party store that I cut perilously short. 
wringing my eyes in the blackest of black eyeliner. Milton subjected himself to a long, ratty wig that I added a few thin braids to, and spent all night with his floppy, lacy cuffs falling into the candy bowl at Dash Nerd's only Halloween party. I still can't believe that, that you sang Sweet Dreams in front of the entire marching band and half the student council, he says. Dash dared me, I reminded him, because Dash was very, very drunk. He clearly thought I wouldn't do it. He thought he had me all figured out. I wanted to prove him wrong. Robin Buckley? Milton's dad asked, sticking his head into the den. He always says my full name for whatever dad reason. Are you staying for Sunday night dinner? That sounds really great, Mr. Bledsoe, I say. Is that... Okay, with me, Milton says, as long as you don't t keep teaming up with my little sister and stealing all the rolls. Sunday dinner at Milton's house is great, as usual. I hope my parents manage to feed themselves without, my, my, without me around. I've been cooking about half of our dinner since I started high school. My, my parents both hate domestic chores. Milton's parents cook together, even on weeknights leaning their heads over their pots in tandem and feeding each other spoonfuls to test things. Milton's mom cooks as much Japanese food as she can, as she can with the nearby grocery stores. I remember in, in middle school that Milton would come in every day with, with bento box lunch and have to endure pretty much everyone gawking at it. In high school, he gets hot lunch with his... In high school, he gets hot lunch like pretty much everybody else. Bag lunches are, are enough uh, to get you beaten up all on your own, courtesy of the monster. Tonight, we have ramen with a miso egg floating right at the top among the broth, meat, and green onion. Milton and I contribute to the feast by making the one dessert I'm good at, Buckeyes. We all stuff our, ourselves with balls of chocolate-dipped peanut butter. Milton's sister, Ellie, puts one in each of our each, each of our cheeks and pretends to be a squirrel. I do it too, pretending I'm 12 again. Amazingly full and strangely happy, I bike back home, my front wheel making a lazy S back and forth on the sidewalk. It's 10.30, maybe edging closer to 11. The streets are quiet and the air is cold. It won't snow for another month probably, but I can feel the first sharp threat of it in the air. I pull my flapping open jacket across my body with one hand as I steer with the other. As soon as I run out of the si as soon as I run out of sidewalk, I have to bike a single mile through almost country from Milton's neighborhood to mine, which is set farther out toward the edge of town. I keep to the thin margin of asphalt between the road and the white line. There's a rustle in the undergrowth uh, at, at the side of the road. I try to ignore it. I do whatever I can to keep the strange, skittering sound from sending nervous flicks of fear across my skin. I ride faster, my wheels now blazing a straight arrow down the road. I hum a little bit of the first song I can find in my head, hungry like a wolf, but the rustle seems to get louder in response. I shout the lyrics at the top of my lungs. Songs about being hunted aren't really helping right now, so I try to think about Operation Croissant. I'm going to tell Milton about it. Soon, I'm going to ask him about, ask him to come with me. I know that he's ready for life beyond Hawkins, too. He's already been to Japan with his family, and he's got amazing travel tips, things that I uh, would never have thought about. How to roll your clothes when you pack instead of folding them. How to find the nearest public restroom without looking like a complete loser. How to decide which books are worth your very limited backpack space. I'm already starting to think that if Operation Croissant works out, we could branch out and visit more countries together. And what about Milton's bands? We might need to plan a road trip to see live music in Chicago and California and New York. There's so many places that aren't, that aren't here. So many places where, where that rustle in the bushes isn't something that I have to think about ever again. Headlights pierce the night behind me, and the rustling goes quiet as a car passes. Right when I um, let myself believe it's gone, it's come back, louder, closer. There's another sound beneath it, of soft and pulsing, 
something like blood rushing through a heart or a breath dragged up a windpipe. I pull onto my street, and by the time um, I, I drop my bike in the driveway, I'm running scared, and I don't know what it is. I sprint to the door. Thank God it's unlocked. Slam it shut, twist the lock behind me, and push my back against the solid wood. I wait for what? I honestly don't know. It's dead quiet in the house. My parents must be asleep. The phone rings so loud that I jump and let out a, a little shriek, the way you sometimes let out a little pee when you laugh too hard. And I pick it up, hoping for a voice, any voice. I hear a second of hard breathing, and I think that whatever just happened to me has happened to someone else in Hawkins. Robin! I sink down to the floor, bringing the receiver with me. The famili familiarity of the voice on the other end erases a good 50% of my fear. Kate? You didn't answer me the first five times I called. What's going on now? Are your parents being weird about phones now? No, I just, uh, I can't imagine telling her what just happened. What would I even say? A raccoon was skittering around in the underbrush, and I had a full breakdown? I guess I stayed at Milton's um, later than usual, I offer faintly. Well, I'm glad you're finally home, because... I have an update. I can hear the glow in her voice. What is it? I ask, knowing that she'll talk about Dash and for once I'll want to hear it. They're, they've been having sloppy, sloppily secret makeout sessions ever since Halloween. But if it isn't official yet, which I know is killing her, we went out she, tonight, she breathes. Out? She starts, in, she starts in on the details of the latest almost sort of date. Her voice wraps uh, me up in a blanket of normalcy. I twist the phone cord around me. Once. Twice. I've almost stopped thinking about whatever was out there in the dark. And then, with the crackle, the phone goes dead. And I'll read chapter 16 very soon.